The topic of today will be this, looking for killers. You will see it will be like a TV series, but we're not going to go to the end today. The, the slide here is something that you have seen very often, or a biosimilar, which is a cytolytic T lymphocyte killing a tumor cell. And through this, we have exquisite tumor specificity, and this we understand very well today. And there is memory in the patients. So you have a very long-term anti-tumor activity when you stimulate that. As you may recall, uh, these cells recognize here a peptide in red presented by HLA class 1 molecules. And the peptide comes from a protein that is usually encoded into the cell, here, below, degraded, and then peptides go into the endoplasmic reticulum, and they are associated non-covalently with the HLA class 1 heavy chains, ABC, and the beta-2 microglobulin. I draw your attention to beta-2 because we'll use it later. And then this trimeric complex can navigate through to the cell surface. Because of this, there were many expected results in uh, immunotherapy with ctl 4 and PD-1 blockade. This is one example. Metastatic melanoma and two studies. The first here with anti-CTLA-4 treatment. And you see approximately one-third patients, responders. And they, through wide exome sequencing, they looked for mutations into the beta-2 microglobulin genes. Usually you have two mutations. One allele is deleted. That's usually what happens. And the other has a nonsense mutation. So the net result is that you do not have functional beta-2 microglobulin at all in these cells. And the second study with patients treated with anti-PD-1. When you look at survival, so the time of survival is in the abscissa here. With anti-CTLA4, you see expectedly that if you have loss of heterozygosity in the beta-2 microglobulin gene, you are uh, not in a very good situation here. Same with anti-PD-1. So there are other published results going into that direction, which, is, which makes perfect sense. Now today, it's pretty clear that we are facing more and more completely unexpected results. I'll give you two examples. First, Hodgkin lymphoma. This is a work by uh, Margaret Shipp in the US. So 72, 72 patients here, and they analyzed HLA class 1 surface expression on the reed Sternberg cells. They looked at beta 2 microglobulin itself, at HLA class 1 heavy chain, and also at, as HLA class, at HLA class 2 as a control. So only 10% of their samples were clearly positive for beta 2 and class 1. There were many like these. You see uh, here the inserts are uh, reed Sternberg cells. You have also a staining with uh, PAX5. This is why it's uh, uh, yellowish throughout, and you see this helps them to identify the reed Sternberg cells, which are dim for this uh, staining. But you clearly see here a membranous pattern of staining with beta-2 here for class 1 and very strong for class 2 there. Then there were samples with decreased expression and clearly samples with completely negative expression, at least with this technique. And I'll show you one example here. So it's pretty clear that the reed Sternberg cells here, they are completely devoid of staining for beta-2 and HLA class 1. But not of class, for, for class 2, as you see on the right. Now, clinically, you, see, you probably know that uh, Hodgkin is one of the tumors that respond best with the higher responding uh, frequency of responses uh, to PD-1 blockade. You clearly have uh, complete responses, I'm losing my mouse here, uh, in patients with a tumor that is completely negative. Same for class one. 
so apparently tumors in which the malignant cells are completely class one negative, they do respond. And what do we have for class two? Well, it's kind of the reverse. You are better off, apparently, if you are positive for class one here. So it's pretty clear here that in that disease, uh, the absence of HLA class one does not prevent the response triggered by PD-1 blockade. So it cannot be, or certainly not only be, cytolytic T cell, CD8 positive cytolytic T cells. Now a tumor that you know much better than Hodgkin probably and then, than, than me, uh, CRC. So here I took this picture from a recent paper from the group of uh, Noel de Miranda. You see clearly here loss of HLA class one staining and the positive uh, stromal cells are always a very important control in these analyses. Here all the cells are positive and you see that there is more staining uh, on the surface or membranous staining. And on the right, it's a qualified as a weak staining. Usually this is something that is induced, inducible, strongly inducible by interferon gamma produced by T cells and NK cells. Now this is not exactly new, it has been done uh, uh, many years ago. They were pioneers in this field of decrease or loss of HLA class one expression, Garrido here in Spain in Granada, and Soldano Ferrone uh, in the US. Now, they collected data here from a uh, cohort of patients in the Netherlands, and you see that you have clearly HLA losses in uh, tumors that are MSI, and there is a higher proportion of HLA class one absence in these tumors. Same in a French cohort, so higher proportion of class one negative among the MSI tumors. Correlation with CMS subtype, they are mostly the losses in CMS1. And now with the sites of metastasis, and it, this is curious, you have few HLA class one losses in the liver metastasis. So if you have no class one there, you do not go to the liver, apparently. It's possibly due to the activity of NK cells. They analyzed the genetic mechanism behind these losses. And so you see different type of mutations that will lead to the absence, basically, of the protein. HLA ABC, beta 2, for 12 tumors with an HLA class one loss on histology. Then other ones, TAP1, TAP2, and these are the genes encoding these two molecules here, so they are absolutely required if you want these peptides at the cell surface. Then here, these three are, this is a less simplistic uh, drawing of antigen presentation, so it's tapazine, calvreticulin, and ERP57. These are chaperones that are needed to stabilize the HLA class one heavy chain there before the peptide is brought in and locked into this groove and then the addition of beta-2 microglobulin. And then the heavy chain will detach from tapazine, which is a resident protein from the endoplasmic reticulum, and can then uh, move to the cell surface. Here, these are all uh, genes encoding subunits of the proteasome or of the regulatory here, subunits of the proteasome here in the middle, the proteolytic subunits. They can also be mutated. Others, this is an important transcription factor for HLA class one uh, expression, a, a master switch regulator. And here on the right, you have all genes implicated in interferon gamma receptor signaling. So you see that th there is a wide array uh, of genetic causes to these HLA class one defects at the cell surface. Now, is that important clinically? Well, you see here, and these are results from the Sloan Kettering, that among tumors here on the bottom, for example, these ones here, uh, on which no expression of beta-2 microglobulin could be detected. Well, these MSI high, uh, these MSI tumors, they did respond to the treatment. So we have, again, the same situation that in that setting, uh, MSI, uh, colon carcinomas, 
They respond to PD-1 blockade despite the complete absence, apparently, of surface HLA class 1 molecules. <laughs> so clearly, here again, CD8 positive CTLs cannot do that, or certainly cannot do that alone. Something that 15 years ago would, would have been, was completely unexpected, and I think it's extremely interesting. So other cells have to be involved if lytic cells are implicated in there, which is, I think, very likely. They, of course, should be tumor-specific or tumor-selective in a way or another, so we need to understand that. They cannot kill everything, because this is not what is happening in your patients when they respond. And obviously, they should express PD-1 to be sensitive to PD-1 blockade. So we have many candidates around for you for this. And I will not go into all the details because simply dealing with, with one of these categories would require uh, 15 minutes, but maybe uh, later if that proves very really important for a precise type of cancer. So in addition to the CD8 uh, HLA class 1 restricted T cells, CD4 T cells, which recognize peptide on class 2, can also have lytic activity. So this is poorly studied because they are the CTLs next door. But they are there. We see that they have this potential. And there are a few instances in the viral world where, where they are uh, important. Then, of course, the natural killer cells. You know or maybe do not know that, but the mechanisms of lysis are diverse, a bit more diverse than what is usually said to, to simplify the thing. So they are the lytic granules with perforin and granzymes. So they deliver into the target cell a cargo that induces apoptosis. But then tumor necrosis factor, which is present on the surface, can do that. Right? It can lead to apoptosis. And other members of the TNF and TNF receptor family can do that as well. So fast ligand is, of course, very well known. If you have FAS uh, uh, on the target cell, which is common, and then this trail, so this other molecule that can do that as well. These things are not much studied and certainly not yet in human oncology. NK cells, uh, they are clearly the next very promising candidates for obvious reasons. So they are very complex cells, but what is important for today simply here is what you see here. So they kill when they are activated, and they are all of them equipped with two types of receptors, some that activate them, and you will see that there are many such receptors. They need to be engaged. And then there are also receptors that inhibit them. And the most studied, and possibly the most important, but this, this depends on the, the topic in which you, you work, are those that recognize HLA class one molecules themselves. So why is this? Well, we use this to defend ourselves against viruses. Viruses are equipped with proteins that, don't, uh, that decrease HLA class 1 expression in the infected cells. This is kind of a rule. So they escape CTL recognition, partly. What do we do next? Well, we use NK cells, which detect this HLA class 1 decrease or loss through these receptors and will kill the infected cells. So to clear a viral infection, you always need CTLs to have something that is very specific, and also NK cells for the escaping, for the escaping cells. So activating an NK, so here again, tumor cells would require either the absence of the inhibitory ligand, for example, absence of HLA class 1, which is exactly what we were mentioning, or a high number or quality of the activating receptors. And this is what you have with FC gamma receptors, for example, which are on NK cells. And this is res responsible for ADCC, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, which, which you have with rituximab or uh, trastuzumab. What would NK cells recognize now uh, to be activated? Well, the choice is large, so this is the all the activating receptors that we have on our NK cells. So not all our NK cells express all these receptors, which makes it even a bit more complex. And here are the inhibitory receptors, and these are the ones that are HLA class 1 specific. So you see that it's a complex world, and it can be difficult to exactly identify who is doing what in what tumor. 
Then we have others. We have NKT cells. Uh, so some of them are, have invariable T cell receptors. We know reasonably well what they recognize, kind of lipid antigens presented on an HLA-like molecule, which is called CD1. All these things, of course, we have not to defend ourselves against pathogens, and that, that's the reason of, for their presence. Gamma delta T cells, so they use a receptor that has other chains than, than our conventional T cells, so gamma and delta chain instead of alpha and beta. There are various kinds of them. Some of them recognize phosphopeptides uh, that are uh, produced inside the target cell. Then we have innate lymphoid cells. Uh, there are several varieties of these cells. Again, the mechanisms of lysis would be, would be the same. All these cells can and have been shown to be able to express PD-1, so everything is still possible there. Now, we'll end with this. Uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, new opportunity to, thanks to these patients, uh, to understand other modalities that we might have to deal with tumor cells. Uh, I think that it is also possible that we do not use the same mechanisms to really reject a tumor, which is possibly happening in melanoma patients, for example, that are surviving tumor-free, clinically tumor-free for 10 years or more. Maybe really this is a true tumor rejection, like a, a graft rejection. It's out forever. But maybe it's not exactly the same when you have what I've called here tumor stabilization. So these patients in which the tumor is uh, smaller but does not go away. Well, you know that better than I do. It's maybe different. And sometimes we might have the two together. The alternative, of course, is to have always the same type of lytic mechanism that can reject but are, that are continuously inhibited by immunosuppressive mechanisms. So that is the classical uh, way of thinking today. But we don't know what is really happening. Of course, different types of killers, you see what they can be, can be active in different types of tumors or in different, in different patients with the same type of tumors. Who knows? I think that understanding this will maybe uh, help us to discover new ways of attacking tumor cells, which could be used to other tumors than those I've mentioned, and who do not respond at all to checkpoint blockade today. So I think we have interesting uh, years ahead of us, a lot to discover because we are very far, obviously, from understanding what is going on now. And I think that it is not enough to simply find one or two CTLs in a patient against a neoepitope or something which is expected. So it's the science of the expected result. But this does not mean that these things alone are doing the job. So it's a bit too easy, of course, it helps to get a great paper, but uh, it's probably not enough. And I'm convinced that it will be important to follow the patients. It's not necessarily obvious to re uh, reconstruct all that in animal models. And we will need detailed analysis of patients, not necessarily tons of them, who are really regressing under these treatments in these conditions that I've shown to you, and understand exactly what is going on before, during, this is key, during and after a tumor regression. So the people in the lab like me will need the clinicians like you because without that access to material, I'm sure that it, it might take decades with the proper access of the, to the material, it might be faster. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>